Neuropsychiatric Talent 2022. My name is Maria Malavite, and I'm one of the founders of uh, Neuroscience Club. Hello, I am Nitesh Shriharan, Head of Neuro-Oncology and Pathology Division of UNC. UNC has been established by the students of TSMU and is one of the biggest bodies in TSMU, dedicated specifically for medical students who are interested and wish to pursue their field in, a, in the neuroscience. We decided to organize Neuropsychiatry Summit for everybody who's interested in neuro. Whether you're a professor, doctor, or student, I'm sure today you will learn something new. And uh, before we introduce our first guest, I would like to mention that today on October 10th, it is Mental Health Awareness Day worldwide, and it's an international day for worldwide mental health education, awareness, and advocacy against social stigma, which has been bothering not just general population, but doctors as well. So let's just emphasize our mental health and well-being as a worldwide priority. Today, we are grateful for the opportunity to be able to listen to world and our physicians and learn from their knowledge and expertise in their respective fields. So if you have any question, feel free to type it, or in the end of the presentation, you can actually ask it. We are fortunate to have such honorable, distinguished, and established doctors as our guest speakers, and we would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Jason Stepko. He is actually a board certified psychiatrist who has completed his internship at St. Luke Roosevelt Hospital in Manhattan and a psychiatry residency at Sunny Upstate Medical University. Our speaker has extensive experience in community mental health, having served in the past as a medical director for Cofen County Mental Health. As the director of the CNY Psychiatry, he has also maintained a private practice for the past 10 years, where he provides comprehensive psychiatric care to his patients in a personalized setting. Today, he will discuss about interventional psychiatry. It is actually one of the new and exciting fields in psychiatry with growing utility for psychiatric and neurologic disorders. Everybody, please welcome Dr. Jason Stepkovich. All right, good morning, everybody. All right, well, I know I have limited time and this is a big topic. Uh, I was asked to talk about neuromodulation, which would cover an awful lot. So I'm gonna be focusing on transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, which is a treatment modality that we do offer in my clinic here in upstate New York. Uh, we, have a, we have a small, uh, psychiatric clinic outside of the city of Syracuse uh, for those who are familiar with uh, New York geography. All right, so uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, I don't know how familiar any of you are with it. So I, actually, I, this is a, a rather basic talk and I'm going to just sort of address the audience as though this is completely new and novel to everybody. Um, and I'm gonna start with the premise that electrical stimulation is healthy and good for the brain. Psychiatry, as uh, you all know, has used electrical stimulation really uh, since the, the late 1930s, uh, when um, two it Italian physicians ran a direct current across uh, a brain of a depressed individual and found it to be beneficial, uh, Bini and Soletti. Uh, and ECT was born from that. Uh, that's been around for a long time. Of course, direct current has its limitations, um, you, you know, namely resistance. You're hitting the entirety of the brain uh, to the point that the patient is, you know, we're inducing a seizure. Uh, and it's done generally uh, in the United States in a hospital setting uh, under general anesthesia. So very effective treatment but a lot of you know, problems attached to it, historic problems, not to mention also like cultural baggage. Uh, so we have desperately uh, needed new therapeutic modalities in psychiatry. Uh, transcranial magnetic uh, stimulation utilizes the benefits of electrical stimulation, but it's, it's generating electromagnetic fields, which allows us to target disparate parts of the brain and also bypasses the problem of electrical resistance, right? So getting through skin, bone, dura matter into brain tissue and eliciting neuronal depolarization, which is what we're looking to do uh, in the case of, of TMS therapy. So I'm gonna actually stop utilizing the term uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a bit of a mouthful uh, and, and go to TMS if you don't mind. Okay, so again, big topic. Um, this is a, a lecture in and of itself, the etiology of depression. Um, I, I hope 
uh, the monoamine theory, well, it's good to be aware of it, but that is not the prevailing theory of depression anymore. Uh, and that, you know, stems from, uh, you know, study giving reserpine to individuals and uh, basically working backwards in 1952, uh, the physician who did that study uh, found that actually patients taking reserpine who were depressed, some of them actually uh, had a lifting of their depression and that really was the advent of modern psychopharmacology, um, which, you know, for the last largely 70 years, psychiatry has been following, um, you know, the monoamine hypothesis that, that basically depression, um, you know, is predicated on uh, an Im imbalance of monoamines, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine in the brain. Uh, now we have the advent of tricyclics and, you know, SSRIs, SNRIs. Um, all of the medications that you guys have learned about or, or maybe are prescribing in your own practices. Um, we now actually think that things are far more complicated than that and that the current you know, model of thinking is one you know, predicated on neuroplasticity, right? That there's uh, a problem of neural connectivity and syn synaptic communication, um, even death of neurons, you know, cellular death occurs uh, when somebody actually is going through a major depressive episode. And this is where I think neuromodulation really comes in and is quite logical. Oh, what did I do? I just clicked something. Okay. All right. Well, I did click that. I've got my wife helping me here, so we're both lost. Okay. Um, so here you have on the left, uh, a depressed brain. You know, this is looking at a PET scan. On the right, you have a, a non-depressed brain, and you can see, you know, the, the patterns uh, in blood flow and metabolic patterns. Particularly, if you look at the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, um, you, you, you see, you know, very different but very characteristic patterns. So, what happens if you repetitively stimulate uh, the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex with electrical stimulation? Uh, say thousands of times, uh, and you do this daily for several weeks. Um, well, uh, you see a lot of actually really good things. So one thing that you see is actually those blood flow patterns uh, normalizing, right? So in the case of a depressed brain, you see diminished uh, cerebral perfusion, uh, diminished uh, 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 cerebral activity in those brain brains or in those uh, those parts of the brain. Um, you see actually diminished secretion of something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. BDNF is actually very important uh, in the formation of new uh, dendritic growth and the uh, synaptogenesis, as well as uh, you know, new neuronal uh, generation. Uh, and that actually gets, you'll see reduced BDNF patterns in depression. Uh, you actually see increased cortical thickness, right? So possible direct evidence that actually you're, again, generating new neural tissue. Um, and, you know, very importantly, increased neurogenesis in the hippocampal region. Uh, the hippocampus, of course, is very important in the incorporation of immediate to short-term memory, right? So depression really is not just a mood disorder. And, you know, we definitely very much emphasize that to our patients. It is a neurocognitive condition, right? So all those neurovegetative symptoms uh, that you see in depression beyond just depressed mood, you know, problems with concentration, attention, short-term memory, it's very common for our depressed patients to actually come in and, and actually worry that they're maybe developing dementia or some sort of, you know, very severe neurocognitive condition. Um, you know, this, this actually, this diagram uh, just sort of just shows uh, basically, you know, the, the figure eight coil. So actually when, you know, mechanically uh, the patient sits in a chair, um, there's a coil that is placed over the head. And that's just meant to show that we can target different parts of the brain. You know, I'm, I'm spending right now a lot of time talking about the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, but TMS, you know, we can, we can actually hit any part of the brain. And um, there are many off-label indications uh, for TMS therapy. Uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, panic disorder, um, generalized anxiety disorder, actually migraine headaches, uh, tinnitus, 
uh, you can actually target the, the temporal lobe. Um, you know, and there's there's uh, some very good studies on on its use for tinnitus, uh, neuropathic pain. Uh, you know, even actually memory disorders. So actually, and that's something that uh, my wife is doing some work in our clinic on, uh, you know, catching, if you can catch memory issues early before there's a, probably a critical mass of cell cellular death, using electrical stimulation to treat dementia, I think actually has some very promising uh, uh, potential and, you know, further study is needed on term, uh, in terms of actually like the long-term efficacy of that. But at least in terms of short-term, we're seeing some very significant memory gains uh, after a month of TMS therapy in people with mild cognitive impairment. Um, this slide actually uh, references the STAR-D study. So anybody who's prescribing antidepressant medication should really be familiar with this study. This was the largest antidepressant study ever done. Uh, National Institute of Mental Health uh, sponsored the study. I, I believe the study dates back to 2006, uh, and it's still to this day the largest study of antidepressants. And what the National Institute of Mental Health in the United States did is they took an algorithmic approach. This was a multi-centered study. They took about 4,000 patients and they walked them through a standard treatment algorithm. So you can see like level one was starting uh, everybody on citalopram or Celexa, uh, and approximately 30, I believe it was like 36% of individuals uh, responded to that. So of course, two thirds didn't. They got bumped down to level two of the study, which was, you know, Celexa with another medication or Celexa with cognitive behavioral therapy. Again, it was, I think, 33%, you know, and that uh, level two uh, responded to the combo. By the time though you got to level three of the study, which is a, what a lot of psychiatry is dealing with, a lot of our patients are referred over to us. They've already been on a couple of antidepressants. By the time you reach level three of the study, response rates plummeted down to, I believe about 16%. And then level four uh, was about 13%. So much of my career has been treating patients in that level three, level four zone. and. Um, you know, I, I sort of tell my patients it's it's sort of like going to Vegas and trying to beat the dealer. You know, you may, right? You may, but um, I don't care. This isn't a question of talent, right? Like the the odds are the odds. You know, and and of course there are different augmentation strategies, and you can go to various conferences, certainly here in the United States, and and listen to people who uh, label themselves as psychopharmacologists. But we're still like now dealing with those odds. So psychiatry has desperately needed uh, new, better, different tools beyond um, just, again, these like monoamine uh, interventions. Of course, this is my segue to how wonderful transcranial magnetic stimulation is. Um, okay, so this slide just references one study. This was one of the larger studies of TMS. Um, there, are, there are other studies with better numbers than this. Um, the study uh, had 307 patients and produced a 37.1 remission rate. And this is in the treatment resistant population, which they define as at least two failed drug trials. Okay, so in the difficult to treat population, TMS is basically almost tripling uh, the response rates of treatment compared to, again, SSRIs or SNRIs, MAOIs, the monoamine uh, interventions. You may be wondering about the safety of transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's extremely safe. Um, I actually can't read the right side of my slide here and I, I, can, I can remove that. Okay. Um, yeah, seizure rate of approximately one in 30,000. That's accurate. I just wanted to make sure that that, that number, because I, I made these, these slides a few years ago. Um, yeah, so very low rate of seizure. Uh, we have not had a seizure in our clinic. Uh, most of the docs who I have talked to have had seizures in their clinic. A lot of the time, electrical stimulation may un, you know, unmask an underlying like structural issue in the brain, like a tumor or something like that. Um, so I think actually those rates are probably even lower. Um, headache early on in the course of treatment can be quite common. Uh, and sometimes actually TMS, just because of the location of the stimulation that like left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, if somebody has an underlying dental carrier, dental issue, TMS can unmask that it's happened a couple of times in my clinic. 
and, and, and the actual treatment itself can be a bit of an irritant again, early on, usually like the first, you know, two or three treatments, um, you know, you're, you're actually causing tissue to vibrate. So again, that skin bone dura matter, um, you know, some people can, can actually find that, uh, to be quite irritating, uh, but we haven't really had people drop out because of that. Um, there's almost always a way to help the patient adjust and, and sort of, you know, transition into their treatment. Um, this slide just references the standard FDA approved protocol. It is a daily treatment. Um, again, you're looking to create new neural habits. Uh, so repetition is very important. Um, generally 30, uh, 30 sessions, five days a week. Um, treatments, the, well, the preponderance of, of our treatments are 20 minutes. There's a lot of different protocols. There's actually a three minute protocol, uh, which is very efficacious, but most of our patients are doing the 20 minute protocol. They can drive or walk to the appointment, um, get their stimulation and then go back to their day. And again, this is like, this makes it hugely different than ECT as an example, or even, you know, something like ketamine, uh, which is another sort of rescue treatment, but which is, you know, a, a dissociating uh, agent and um, largely the patient, you know, would have to take the day off from work if they were to go through that. So that's not the case in TMS. It's very non-invasive. Um, there is a, uh, a taper, uh, which again, in the standard protocol uh, lasts for three weeks. Um, you may also be wondering about the durability of this treatment. Um, so after they're done with treatment and hopefully the, you know, they at least get a, a really nice clinical response, which would be defined as, you know, at least a 50% improvement uh, in clinical symptoms, clinical remission is 80 to hundred percent improvement. So once the patient really responds well, are they cured? Uh, and the short answer to that is no, you know, this is, we're largely treating a chronic recurrent condition, right? But what we're looking to do is one, find a treatment that, uh, you know, that is efficacious uh, and that will hopefully be efficacious in the, in the future, right? So nine out of 10 people who respond to TMS will respond well, you know, were they to relapse and, and uh, have a recurrence of their depression and come back in. Um, so that's, you know, phenomenal and, you know, far better than medications. Um, and the durability is really good. So 70% of individuals one year out uh, from TMS therapy uh, will still be in remission. And, you know, we're, we're still a young clinic. I've been doing this for about three years. We have patients that are three years out uh, that have had no recurrence of symptoms. But if, you know, in talking to docs that have been doing this longer than me, at, at, again, at some point, almost everybody will, will have some, some sort of relapse in this population, the treatment resistant population. And this is our clinic and this is my technician. So you can, you know, this is more meant to just give you a sense of what the machine looks like. Um, again, you can see it's, it's really not, you know, really large. Um, uh, and you know, the patient just sits in the chair. We put a cap on them. Uh, it's the physician's job to, uh, to actually, you know, find, to locate the correct part of the brain. Um, and, uh, and then the other question you may have is like, well, how do we know if we're, uh, eliciting okay. neuronal, no, oh, okay. There's, <laughs> yeah. How do we know if we're eliciting neuronal depolarization? And there's a very novel way we do that. We'll actually put the coil over the motor strip, um, and just sort of basically like turn up the power of the machine until we elicit a thumb or a finger to twitch. Uh, and that we, that way we got the, uh, we got those motor neurons to fire. And then that would be, uh, you know, that patient's individualized setting for the remainder of their treatment. We'll, we'll check it periodically throughout the course of treatment. Um, but it's, again, it's very logical. And that's about it. So I don't even know how long that was. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, thanks guys. Thank you, doctor. It was definitely very interesting. We have a few questions from the audience. Uh, okay. First of all, first question was, how does TMS differ from the ECT? So again, the, 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 there are a, a couple of key different uh, differences, right? So the similarity begins and ends with electricity, right? But everything else is really different. So um, TMS is using electromagnetic 
fields, right? So if you think about a mag, any magnet is going to be generating a field around it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and in this, in, in the case of, of the average, the, the average TMS machine, there's a couple of differences. There are different types of coils, right? But the, the, our machine has something called the figure eight coil, where there's actually two magnetic fields, which then create circular. I, I wish I could diagram this, and I, maybe this is too much detail. I wasn't thinking I'd be going into this much detail, but, but the fields basically will converge on a point, right? And so, you know, we're, we're really most of most of the magnetic stimulation is converging on one point in the brain. And we're looking to, you know, as, as uh, accurately as possible, target that point. So uh, we use a medicine or uh, uh, we use a, a technique called the beam method, which is really just a tape measure. It's an old like EEG measurement uh, method. Um, you know, but they're, they're actually like Stanford, uh, some, you know, some of the higher powered research centers in the United States are using functional MRI guided TMS, which is going to be more accurate than what I'm doing. Um, and ECT is direct current, right? So, um, and I know that they've modified it. I'm not trained in ECT. So I think in the last 10 years, they've, they've made some modifications and refined it a little bit more. Um, but it's not going to be targeted in the same way. You're, you're, you might be hitting like hemispheres, you know, you may not be hitting both hemispheres, um, but you're not going to, as an example, you're not going to be able to just stimulate neurons in the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. You're going to be hitting a lot more. And, you know, and that, that's one of the reasons why we think that, um, you know, in ECT, it's quite common for, for patients, even to this day, even though I know like some docs will, will, will dispute this, patients will subjectively complain not uncommonly about memory issues following ECT, um, you know, forgetfulness. I, I, I can think of a patient in my practice not that long ago who was a young guy who got ECT and got lost going to the local mall, around, got confused and, and you know, and um, and really couldn't find him, find his way around, uh, you know, stores that he had been to, you know, dozens of times. You don't see that with TMS, you know, ever really. Um, so the effectiveness is a little bit, the, the numbers are, are still a little bit better for ECT. So, you know, probably by about 10%. Um, so there's still very much a place for ECT. I don't want people like, you know, leaving this uh, today thinking, you know, ECT is a terrible treatment. Not at all. I mean, it's, it's still a very important treatment and it definitely has a place. And, you know, I'm certainly not against ECT, but if it were me uh, and I had treatment resistant depression, um, I would start with TMS. And uh, I sort of, in my algorithmic approach to treatment, um, usually not always, but usually reserve ECT for TMS non-responders, you know, for that 30% or so folks that don't really respond robustly to TMS. So I don't know if that answers that question, but. Yes, actually that's a good segue to the next question we got. What okay. could be the contraindications for TMS? Contraindications for TMS. Um, well, one would be metallic implants, ferrous metallic implants in the head or neck region, right? Um, so if somebody had, and I, I have not even run across that patient. Um, you know, I think they're using a lot of titanium now or other metals, you know, but, but magnetic, uh, uh, metals, uh, that are, would be in the head and neck region. Logically, you know, that would be dangerous given that we're using a magnet, very powerful magnet in that region. You wouldn't want that, uh, moving or damaging tissue. Um, somebody who has active seizures, um, that would be a contraindication. Although, although actually there are seizure protocols for TMS, uh, experimental, but in my clinic, like I would not treat somebody who, you know, right now, uh, is being treated for seizure disorder. Um, cochlear implants, um, you know, again, me mechanical concerns, um, you know, that would be also a contraindication. So we screen for those things before patients come in, but largely, you know, again, the, it's, it's very safe. Right. So if somebody had cardiac history or, you know, severe medical comorbidities, that's really not a concern uh, with TMS therapy. Every now and then um, we can get a, a sort of basal vagal response from, from individuals. That's happened a couple of times uh, where somebody has nearly fainted in the chair. Um, that's not something I, I'm generally concerned about, but 
we have seen that once or twice. Thank you. We have two more questions. Okay. First is actually what I wanted to ask personally. For example, when you have a migraine or a panic disorder, how mm -hmm. would the frequency be here for the each disease or is it all same 20, 30 sessions? I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, would the frequency or the DMS differ for each diagnosis? For example, if you compare migraine and panic disorder and depression, or would it be the same? Um, so the frequency would be, oh, you mean in terms of like the, the, the frequency of treatments, the number of Yes, trials? exactly. Yeah. Um, well, there are different protocols that, again, these are more like smaller studies off-label, um, you know, so it is an example like the memory uh, disorder protocol that, that we, we do use, that's 20 uh, treatments as opposed to like the standard like 30 to 36 with uh, uh, the depression protocol. Uh, there's a migraine protocol that's 10 treatments, uh, tinnitus is 10 treatments. Uh, and, I, you know, and I didn't know how much detail to go into, but it's also very interesting, like you can actually change the frequency of the pulses that you're administering in the machine. Uh, so at 10 hertz, as an example, um, that's actually a stimulatory pulse, right? So you're, you're eliciting neuronal depolarization, but you're communicating to those neurons to basically become more active and send excitatory pulses to neighboring neurons. And there's a sort of cascading effect. At one hertz, you're eliciting neuronal depolarization, but it has a more like GABAergic effect, right? It's more inhibitory, right? So for the case of like generalized anxiety disorder, uh, that might be a very appropriate, you know, thing to do, right? And actually we use a different location for that. Um, and I've done, I've done some of that. Actually, you might even want to do that for major depressive disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so, you know, sometimes if somebody's not responding to one protocol, we may like mid course, like sort of change streams. Like if we're not getting the response that we want to see, um, and sometimes you can get, per, you know, an individual into response just by changing the location or changing the pulse. That makes perfect sense. And yep. one last question, what is the effectiveness for TMS therapy with an antidepressant drug in younger patients? I'm guessing adolescents or under 30. Okay, I'm, I'm really sorry. You're gonna have to repeat the question. What is the... <laughs> <laughs> what is the effectiveness for TMS yep. therapy with an antidepressant in younger patients? Okay, TMS therapy in, in conjunction with antidepressants or compared to antidepressants? In conjunction with antidepressants? Yes. Yeah. So the early studies with TMS actually asked patients to go off of their antidepressants. I, I, I don't know if I'm, I, I'm going to try to answer it and, and, you know, maybe you can guide me if, if, if I'm, if I'm not fully answering the question. Um, so the initial studies on TMS where it got its FDA approval and were, were in 2008 and they had patients, you know, go off of their antidepressants and they got very robust results, but not quite as good as the current studies in which they did not ask people to go off of the antidepressants, the antidepressants, which largely were not working for them, right? So it does seem like, like there is some sort of synergy that happens, uh, you know, with somebody taking an antidepressant, if they're tolerating it, um, you know, it, it does seem like there's about a 10% difference in those numbers, you know, and we're not talking about like a lot of studies on this, you know, I'm just, again, like just the one study that I can think of, um, again, where they asked everybody to be, you know, completely, you know, off of, off of antidepressants. Um, we will, you know, we will treat patients who, you know, are maybe sensitive to medications. A lot of people don't tolerate SSRIs very well. It's not a requirement. Insurance in the United States does make it a requirement. It's not a clinical requirement. Um, but our insurers here do ask people to be on something when they're doing their treatment. Uh, and in terms of like young people, um, there are uh, a lot of small studies. There are a number of small studies on the adolescent population. Uh, it's, it's considered quite safe in the pediatric uh, population. And, you know, personally, again, um, I think that there's a lot of misprescribing and overprescribing of adolescents, and I would see TMS as a very important uh, treatment option for, uh, you know, certainly 
uh, teenagers with suffering, struggling with major depressive disorder. Um, you know, and you look at like, just there's a scourge in the United States of metabolic issues, you know, just, um, you know, teens being very sensitive to the side effects of psychotropic medications and, uh, you know, physicians that I think have been uh, a little too quick to be, you know, prescribing here. Uh, and again, I think it's very important to have alternatives. Um, may I also just mention really quick, and I know this wasn't asked, and I know there's other speakers, and I don't mean to be, you know, uh, taking up everybody's time, but uh, pregnancy is another big problem, right? And um, it's very limiting in terms of, you know, what a psychiatrist is able to prescribe. We need to be, you know, rightfully very concerned uh, about safely managing depression uh, during pregnancy. And um, we need more. We need more studies, but you know, so far the data looks, you know, very good for TMS and pregnancy. And logically, um, you know, given the fact that this is like a focalized treatment, that you know, really, is there any like magnetic energy in our fields? Not really energy, magnetic fields hitting, uh, you know, hitting the uterine area. Yes, but minimal. And given that this is like, you know energy that is naturally around us. Um, logically, I wouldn't really think that this would be, you know, dangerous to a fetus, but probably, you know, we'd like, you know, more data, but um, so far, you know, very safe and something that I feel comfortable uh, utilizing uh, in the pregnant population. Thank you, doctor. It was definitely enlightening and new information for everyone. And uh, I'm sure it was quite new, interesting. Yeah, and thank you for the questions from the audience. Right now, I would love to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Hakuna Stefanovic. He is a certified, board certified both in internal and geriatric medicine. Mm -hmm. She is actually at Tulsa State Medical University alumni. And she completed her residency and fellowship in Upstate University Hospital. Dr. Hatuna will talk about dementia. As dementia becomes more and more prevalent in general medical uh, population and clinics, I think it is very important to know the proper approaches, differentials, and appropriate polypharmacological management uh, to understand the pathophysiology of this diagnosis. So everybody, please welcome Dr. Hatuna and please doctor, share your presentation. <laughs> Uh, good evening, I know it's an evening there, so um, I will try to share it properly, so <laughs> I'm, a, I'm not tech savvy <laughs> like my husband. All right, so let me see. I think, there we go. Okay, so it is very difficult to, can you hear me? Yes, it's yes. quite all right, we can take our time. Yeah, so it is very difficult to talk about dementia in 15 minutes, but I just tried to um, address the most important points. Okay. So, so um, dementia now these no, days- Sorry, you're not sharing. What was that, I'm sorry? You're not sharing the presentation. I thought that was, let me see. All right, let me just get out here. Hmm, ah, okay. How about now? Yes, we can see it, yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so you can see now? Yes, perfectly. Okay, okay. sorry about that. All right, so what is dementia? So. Um, there was DSM-4 definition of dementia, then DSM-5 changed, and there were quite significant changes. So there should be significant cognitive decline from previous level um, and previous performance, uh, at least in one or more cognitive domains. So the difference really is in DSM-4, you needed uh, the impairment in two cognitive domains, and one of them had to be memory. So the DSM-5 changed that. So now one uh, impairment in one is enough, and it doesn't have to be memory. So what are those uh, different cognitive domains? First is learning and memory, of course, 
language domain, executive function, complex attention, perceptual motor, and social cognition. Social cognition is something they really added as well. So, and um, it's very important for this deficit in cognition to um, cause impairment in function, in cognitive functioning. So if somebody functions perfectly despite some deficits, we don't call that dementia. And we will talk about what we call uh, this condition in that case. So the um, first problem usually, which we notice as primary care physicians or geriatricians is the patient stops taking a medication properly. And that usually is a red flag. So taking medications, uh, paying bills, that's what usually gets impaired. So we have to have some impairment in at least complex instrumental daily activities. Then it's very important for this condition, for this deficit not to be caused and not to occur during the course of delirium. And we'll briefly talk about what delirium is as well. And these cognitive deficits shouldn't be called, caused, of course, by other mental disorders, such as, for example, schizophrenia or bipolar or major depressive disorder or anything else. Now, what are the types of dementia? And um, there are a lot of them. Now, predominant majority is Alzheimer's disease. And I would say it's about 65% of all dementia is Alzheimer's disease. And then 20% of them is mixed with Alzheimer's. So we have Alzheimer's mixed with vascular dementia, Alzheimer's mixed with Lewy body dementia. So what about, and we will talk about Alzheimer's more. Um, what about vascular dementia? So it's a little bit confusing. Many times uh, I see the diagnosis of vascular dementia, which really is not founded. So time connection is one of the most important criteria. So if somebody has a stroke and after recovering from the stroke, they never regain the same level of cognition that is by definition vascular dementia. There are also criteria based on imaging. Just having small vessel ischemic disease changes, those hyperintensities, white matter hyperintensities, is not enough to say that somebody has vascular dementia. Those hyperintensities should be moderate to severe intensity. They have to be very extensive. Or a patient should have bilateral cortical or subcortical strokes for us to say that this is probably vascular dementia. Or there should be dementia in strategic area. One, I'm sorry, the stroke in strategic area. Even one stroke in this case will cause dementia. And what are those areas? It's thalamus, basal ganglia, angular gyrus, and medium um, temporal lobes, inferior medial temporal lobes. So if you have even one stroke in those areas, you will get demented. What about Lewy body dementia? So Lewy body dementia includes two types of dementia. So, and there are also some others with Parkinsonian features, but mainly we're talking about diffuse Lewy body disease and uh, Parkinson's related dementia, dementia in Parkinson's disease. So um, diffuse Lewy body disease starts with prominent visual hallucinations. So patient just describes them. They're vivid, sometimes they're pleasant, sometimes they're not. And at that point, the patient does not really have diagnosis of Parkinson's. Parkinsonian features may appear later. So they, um, in the Lewy bodies, in this case, starts from cortex and migrates down to subcortical areas. In um, Parkinson's disease dementia, the Lewy bodies start in subcortical areas and then they go up in, in cortex as well. So at the end stage of both uh, diffuse Lewy body or Parkinson's related dementia, you can't really differentiate it because there are Lewy body everywhere then. The presentations are different. Then there is frontotemporal dementia. This is also a very complex group of dementias, but we usually talk about behavioral type or language type. In behavioral type, there is abrupt change in personality. 
the uh, family cannot recognize person. The person becomes socially inappropriate, disinhibited, and it's a big change from, from like previous functioning. So it gets worse. It's very hard to treat. Essentially, you patients are treated with psychotropic drugs. There is really no treatment for it. And there is a language type, primary progressive aphasia, when uh, word finding, uh, speaking becomes a big problem and it's out of proportion of what you expect in Alzheimer's because in Alzheimer's advanced stage, language also becomes a problem. And eventually these patients become mute. Frontotemporal dementia, uh, as a rule, starts at earlier age than Alzheimer's. Then there is, of course, normal pressure hydrocephalus, which presents with triad of gait impairment, urinary incontinence, and dementia. And if diagnosis is made early, before there are irreversible changes in the brain, you can reverse it by doing uh, VP shunt, ventricular, uh, the ventricular peritoneal shunt. And then there are very rare types, for example, prion diseases, Wilson's disease, and so on, which I personally have not seen. Um, they are usually taken care of by specialists, by cognitive neurologists. And important entity is also mild cognitive impairment, which is a pre-stage of dementia. And I, in my clinic, I see a lot of patients with mild cognitive impairment. So what is different in this case, function is not impaired yet, but it's not a benign condition, especially amnestic type mild cognitive impairment when short term memory is impaired predominantly. So in this case, the progression to dementia is very high. Over five years, it's 80%. But 20% do not progress and stay stable. That's why we do not call these patients demented. So let's go to the next slide. What about Alzheimer's disease? Again, predominant majority of Alzheimer's patients are not taken care of by uh, specialists. They're actually taken care of by primary care physicians uh, and geriatricians if those are available. So this is disease of older age. However, there's a subtype of early onset Alzheimer's, which is about 1% of the disease, uh, which uh, is actually uh, autosomal dominant and which is associated with um, uh, amyloid precursor protein, presenilin-1 and presenilin-2 mutations. Uh, but most of Alzheimer's start later in life, uh, life and genetics matter there as well. If you have apoprotein E4, two genes, the uh, chances of getting late onset Alzheimer's is very high. However, because we do not have a gene therapy, we do not have disease disease modifying therapies, unfortunately, at this point, we do not recommend genetic screening for these patients. Now, we have to always get the imaging of the brain. And um, so why? It's actually, if you don't have any acute changes, that proves that you're dealing with Alzheimer's disease. Of course, if it clinically, it looks like Alzheimer's disease. We do order MRI just to rule out something else. And what is that? Something else would be the, for example, brain tumor. I had an um, unfortunate dentist when I just started my private practice whose wife brought him because he could not um, really manipulate anymore. And he, were, he was missing the teeth when he was trying to uh, treat the patient. And when we got, when we did cognitive testing, we saw significant impairment in visual spatial orientation and he turned out to have uh, glioblastoma. So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to rule out tumor. We're trying to rule out stroke or maybe anything, some, uh, something consistent with infection. So if MRI doesn't show anything significant, then you're most likely dealing with Alzheimer's disease. Um, other uh, investigations, such as FDG PET scan, which looks at glucose metabolism, SPECT, which looks at perfusion, amyloid PET scans, lumbar puncture, those are reserved only for people who participate in some kind of research or who have 
um, atypical presentation and they're younger. We don't usually order those. So the stages of Alzheimer's, mild stage, moderate and severe. At mild stage, it, mild stage is very hard to treat because patients are in denial and they fight their family, they fight the doctors. They don't believe that they have a problem. So we have a lot of problem to tell them not to drive and then they hate us for that. But in moderate stage, many times the behavioral problems start. So you have to treat them. Yes, we try to use antidepressants for that. Uh, for sometimes citalopram in the study show that it kind of helps the behaviors, but many times we have to use antipsychotics. And of course, it's very important to select the right antipsychotic. So now how do we evaluate these patients in the clinic? We always ask them to come with a family member, as we call them informants. And while my staff is doing cognitive testing on the patients, I usually sit down with the family members. Very important to get the history. When did it start? When, how is, has it been progressing? Has been progressing slow and gradual or it happened abruptly. Um, very important to find what the patient's baseline was and how it changed. I always ask the question, what is that patient, what is she or he best in doing? So some of them are best in paying bills, some of them are best in cooking, and are they able to do, to continue doing whatever they're best at? Uh, so we really want to know did function decline or not, because that's very important. Without decline in function, we cannot diagnose dementia. And then very important, and my staff knows, medication review. You will be surprised how many times a patient's cognitive deficit is related to using inappropriate medication. In geriatrics, we have beers criteria for inappropriate medications. So, um, and those really cause problems. For example, Benadryl, people use Benadryl for sleep. And invariably in a month or so, they will end up in memory clinic. And this continuation of Benadryl, especially if it's timely, will reverse the cognitive de deficits. Same with tricyclic antidepressants, anything which is very anticholinergic, because we know that patients with Alzheimer's disease or other types of dementia, they're deficient in acetylcholine. So um, acetylcholine is very important. So avoiding anticholinergic medications, is very important. Other group very important is benzodiazepines. So if patients are on these kind of drugs, we stop them appropriately. Obviously, sometimes you have to taper them down, and then we reevaluate them. Now it's very important to do a very thorough physical examination. So to look for atypical features. So Parkinsonism is very important to. Um, check for cogwheeling, rigidity, for tremor, to check for any um, deficits, neurological deficits, to assess the gait, to ask about urinary incontinence. And we do usually comprehensive uh, workup. We do blood work to rule out vitamin deficiencies, electrolyte disturbances. And of course we screen for depression and we uh, get the MRI of the brain. Now, how do we do the cognitive evaluation? Now, if the patient comes uh, to our clinic first time, we do the MMSC, which is minimum mental state examination. That's a standard. However, if you're dealing with a very educated patient, MMSC will be normal. It doesn't mean that patient doesn't have a deficit. So we immediately will go uh, advance and, and do advanced testing. MOCA will be one of them, which is Mon Montreal Cognitive Assessment. And I will show you what that assessment looks like. Then we will do um, auditory verbal learning tests, which assesses the ability to learn new information. We read out 15 words um, to the patient and give them five trials to learn those 15 words. And score 35 and above is, is normal, indicates that patient can learn a new material. And then for uh, to assess the information processing speed, 
we do digit simple substitution test. So there is a key we um, have that on test which shows which symbol goes with which number and patient has to fill those symbols under the different numbers. We of course do assess for depression, we do geriatric depression scale and very important to do follow up cognitive testing, especially if you are dealing with medication induced problem or if you're dealing with mild cognitive impairment because you need to know if it's progressing or if, or if it's getting better. Sorry, <laughs> dogs. So this is a mini mental state examination. Most of you probably know. Uh, I will go and describe more uh, Montreal cognitive assessment because we don't have that much time, which is most widely used in my uh, practice. This is geriatric depression scale. When we ask patients the questions, like are you basically satisfied with your life? Uh, do you feel hopeless? Do you think your memory is worse than others? And, and questions like that. And then if uh, positive questions are more than five, it points towards depression together with in conjunction with some other symptoms. So this is Montreal cognitive assessment. This one. Ah. So in the first part here, we do uh, trail B in testing, so which is we tell the patient to connect the numbers with the letters in ascending order that assesses visual special executive function, the copy, the cube, and sorry, and draw a clock and show us the time. So then we test some language functions. Again, we have to test the different domains. Many times, for example, people will say this is hippopotamus when it's a rhinoceros. Um, then we uh, ask the patient to remember five words and we do that twice. So we do registration. We tell them five words, they have to immediately repeat it. And we will do in five minutes, recall of those words. And then at the end of the test, and that's about 10, 15 minute um, duration, we will ask about those uh, again. This is a very important part of the test, delayed recall. And this is always impaired in patients with Alzheimer's disease or amnestic type mild cognitive impairment. So here we have a attention test when we ask the patients to repeat the numbers um, the forward or backwards, we ask them to clap when they hear letter A, um, and they do serial subtraction of sevens. And another language uh, function here, language fluency, they have to name the word starting with letter F or repeat the sentences we tell them. And also in abstract thinking, again, executive functioning to um, Tell us what's the similarity. For example, if we're saying train and bicycle, they have to say means of transportation, uh, not just wheels. And again, at the end of the test, we ask about those five words, which we ask them to remember here. And this is a really the very critical area here. Um, even if you, a patient scores 26, which, can, which is considered normal, but he only remembered one out of five words. That is very concerning. Now, again, as I mentioned before, cognitive deficits and dementia need to be differentiated from delirium. And delirium is a condition which is caused by a medical condition, by uh, intoxication, substance into intoxication or withdrawal, or medication side effect. And, uh, this, uh, and it's really associated with a fluctuating level of consciousness and disturbance in cognition. Patient has like looks different every time you see the patient, they have lucid moments and then they are confused. They may have hypoactive uh, or hyperactive features. They can be very agitated, their sleep, wake cycle is disturbed. Important thing is that those changes occur 
in a very short period of time, hours to days. And they are significant, significantly different from the patient's baseline. So that's why we also interviewed the informants. We need to know, are these changes gradual and slowly progressing or these changes occurred abruptly? So then we, uh, if abrupt, then we will have to rule out delirium and we'll have to do obviously medical workup. And very important also, there's a term you probably know, pseudodementia, which uh, means that um, demand, dementing symptoms or cognitive impairment is caused by untreated depression. And obviously we have to treat depression and then reevaluate them. If it's only uh, related to depression, then it will resolve. Um, many times there is a coincidence and you, have both of them occurring at the same time. So what do you see in cognitive testing? You, uh, in pseudo-dementia, you see impairment of concentration. You don't see as much impairment in short-term memory. So what are, again, the features of atypical, um, features which are atypical for Alzheimer's disease, which will prompt further workup? Again, Parkinson is very important to assess the patient for that because then you may be dealing with Lewy body dementia or Parkinson's disease dementia. Um, and again, visual hallucinations, prominent visual hallucinations, as well as REM sleep behavior disorders are early features of um, Lewy body dementia. If you have behavioral abnormalities or you have aphasia, you're dealing with frontotemporal dementia. If you have gait impairment in urinary incontinence together with cognitive impairment, you think about normal pressure hydrocephalus. And if dementia is rapidly progressing in younger age patient, this will require and prompt the um, more workup, and this will prompt me to send these patients for evaluation to a neurologist. And we have cognitive neurologist actually in SUNY Upstate, and interestingly, she's Georgian as well. Her name is Tina Tinchabrashvili. So she's been very helpful. So many times we will send the patients there, and she will help us with the diagnosis. And usually she sends those patients back for management. How about the management? Well, acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. Those medications increase the acetylcholine level in the brain, as we said, in Alzheimer's and even in vascular dementia, there's a deficit of acetylcholine in the brain. Not very effective medications, but it does slow down the progression of the disease. Um, maybe on average by one year. NMDA receptor antagonist, Mementin is the medi medicine which um, protects from glutamate toxicity. Again, not very effective. The recently approved drug, Aducanumab, which is same as Aduhel, um, it was, people were very excited about it. However, it's 55,000 a year. That's the cost of the medication. Um, which obviously uh, most of the insurances are not paying. Um, it is um, monoclonal antibody against uh, amyloid and uh, really shows significant reduction of amyloid in the brain. However, it's not clear if it, if it uh, really helps clinically, not yet. So right now this drug is still used in big research centers, but cannot be used by like usual offices like ours. Transcranial magnetic stimulation, as Dr. Jason talked about, very promising. It's safe, it doesn't have side effects, and we do have patients with mild cognitive impairment doing very well with it. We uh, do 10 or 20 sessions, and then we do boost treatments. Every two, three months, they will come and do three, four sessions. Antidepressants are very important because in the course of disease, uh, there is depression many times, and they are very helpful and very important to use the right antidepressants. Paxil is not, paroxetine is not a good choice because it's very anticholinergic. 
even Prozac, because Prozac will cause, uh, fluoxetine will cause interaction with multiple drugs. So, we, so usually we use citalopram or sertraline. Those are the mainly antidepressants, which are elderly friendly. Insomnia is a big problem, but we have good um, two medications which we use, mirtazapine or trazodone, because they don't usually cause cognitive side effects. And then treatment of behaviors. This is a challenge because it's not easy to treat. Sometimes nothing works, so there's no point to keep patient on medication which does not work. And again, there are antipsychotics which are better Quetiapine is one of them, but it doesn't always work. So I usually we will use quetiapine. I will use geodone, which is ziprazidone, sometimes abilify, which is aripiprazole. Um, but we have to use them. There is FDA warning about using these medications in elderly, in demented patients. So we have to be very careful. And if we use it, then we have to taper them off as, as soon as we can. And obviously, end stage, we uh, do palliative care. Usually, um, the patient's family doesn't want any aggressive interventions after the patient enters that stage. So we provide palliative care either at home or in the facilities. Um, well, that's all I could do in 15 minutes. So do you have any questions? Thank you, doctor. It's like try, dementia is a very broad topic and it's also one of the most important ones that we all have to know. And you are able to like summarize it with the most important points. And that's actually very great for us. Uh, mm -hmm. We just have a couple of questions. Um, so one of the questions was, can like any mental issues, for example, like depression or maybe if, even mania can be a predisposition for dementia? I'm sorry, what was the question? Uh, can any mental issues such as mm -hmm. depression or mania be a predisposition for dementia? The mental illness like depre depression yeah. or the bipolar yeah. clearly yeah. will increase the risk of dementia. There's no question about that. And uh, so we have to screen for them. We have to screen for them also to make sure that uh, symptoms are not uh, related just to a presentation of those mental okay. illnesses, yeah. right? But by having the having the depression mm -hmm. clearly increases risk of dementia, and that's well proven by the studies. Okay, um, yeah, it seems like that was the only question we had. So really, thank you so much, Dr. Katuna, for giving giving some time for us for this. A conference and uh, hope we can see again in the future. All right, there is. Thank you very much. One more question. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned laboratory um, analysis right now. What labs would you do? Uh, uh, for example, I would think hypothyroidism or what else would be considered before diagnosing dementia? So we uh, do comprehensive uh, laboratory assessment. So first of all, uh -huh. we have to check vitamin B12 because we yes. know that vitamin B12 deficiency can cause problems. Folic acid deficiency can cause problems. They, um, I've seen a lot of vitamin B12 deficiency. I haven't really seen too much folic acid deficiencies in my patient. Thyroid is a big problem. So I actually had a patient with mild cognitive impairment. The wife brought him very concerned that he just crashed. He just couldn't function. And sure enough, his TSH was more than 10. And the minute we corrected his thyroid abnormalities, he got much better. So we check, we have to make sure electrolytes are within normal limits because like, let's say hypokalemia or hyperkalemia, low sodium can also cause uh, cognitive impairment. So um, those are mainly what we do. Of course, we do uh, brain scan, as I said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Katna. So our next speaker is Dr. Daniel Jackson, who has completed his psychiatry residency at Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York, and is currently a forensic psychiatry fellow at Upstate Medical University. He has published on religion and spirituality in bipolar disorder as well as treatments for fibromyalgia and opioid use disorder. 
So please welcome Dr. Daniel Jackson. Doctor, you're ready to present. Kamajoba Didi Madloba Motsuhevichwis. Thank you for having me. So I'm gonna try to share my screen here. And are you all able to uh, see? Yes. Yes. OK. So uh, I was requested to speak on chronic traumatic encephalopathy, uh, which I will go by the shortened uh, CTE uh, from here on out. And I was also asked to talk about uh, its relevance in a criminal uh, capacity. And uh, so naturally it's going to be in a forensic a psychiatric uh, context. And so gonna see what this diagnosis entails, uh, how it's diagnosed, some of the complexities with that, and then what the forensic psychiatrist role is currently and what may be uh, in the future. Now, with regards to, I think I actually went forward a slide. Ah, okay. So chronic traumatic encephalopathy, while it's gotten a lot of notoriety through American football players, this diagnosis went by another name and has been present or at least characterized uh, for at least a century. Its original name was dementia pugilistica. Uh, derived from Latin meaning uh, a boxer out of his mind. And so in the 1920s, uh, it was noticed that these boxers, because of getting repetitive uh, head trauma, they would have various behavioral changes, various mood changes. And it was thought that it is uh, due to the nature uh, of the injuries uh, that they su uh, sustain. Now, there are quite a few things to, to take into consideration regarding uh, the diagnosis itself, and this is why it can be controversial. One, currently it can only be diagnosed after someone is dead, and it's via uh, histology, really. So you're taking neuropathological uh, analyses, and you're trying to find consistent findings that can uh, be specific and will rule in CTE and not overlap with other forms of neurodegenerative uh, diseases. There have been attempts to reach a consensus on diagnosing this, uh, but it's still just not quite solid yet. Uh, a lot of progress has been made, but it's not uh, very black and white yet, although uh, it, it is becoming more and more uh, defined and specific. And what you see on this slide is one of the results of one of these consensus meetings. I'm not gonna read out all of this. I realize it's a, a busy slide, but really the, the main point here is there have been attempts to find a, or describe a pathognomonic lesion uh, for CTE. And it basically involves, you know, the structural proteins uh, of the brain and, uh, it's gonna involve uh, phosphorylated tau proteins. And that would be one pathomonic uh, lesion. And then you'll have various supporting features that would involve uh, the cortical uh, and subcortical structure, uh, structures, including the brainstem. And uh, one other thing that's I think worth noting is that since this is a tau protein pathology, you would think that it would have a lot in common with other uh, tauopathies like Alzheimer's dementia. But interestingly enough, you can find people who had comorbid uh, side nucleopathies like Parkinson's dementia and Lewy body dementia. Uh, so just because it's a tauopathy does not necessarily mean that you're going to have uh, a ton of symptomatic overlap with uh, something like Alzheimer's dementia, although it is possible. And you know, part of the pathognomonic lesion uh, that's described here is that you have these tau protein aggregates. Uh, you're also gonna have neurofibrillary uh, 
uh, tangles and astrocytic uh, uh, ta uh, tangles as well. And these are gonna be preferentially found in the depths um, uh, of the, the cortex. So you're gonna find it in the, uh, the sulci of the cortex. And you have cortical involvement pretty much everywhere typically, except the primary uh, visual cortices. And so it, it stands to reason that, you know, this could be found just about anywhere in the brain uh, with just, you know, some small uh, exceptions. And what you can find here is a, a bit of a progression. So in the top left picture, you have uh, these phosphorylated tau protein aggregates that are perivascular. So you see that blood vessel there uh, in cross section and the, the dark staining represents the phosphorylated tau. And uh, at the top right uh, picture, uh, you see the, the, the sulcus, which also the dark staining represents the tau proteins. And in the bottom slide, you can see this progression where the first uh, picture on the left, you have perivascular involvement. Uh, then that involvement spreads and eventually reaches the soul side. So by the time you get to the bottom right, uh, you have extensive involvement in the soul side. And this slide is really just to highlight that, you know, what we're dealing with here is uh, pathology that can reach just about every corner of the brain, uh, except the primary visual cortices. So when you take into account the various uh, frontal lobe regions, uh, particularly the orbital frontal cortex and the dorsolateral uh, prefrontal cortex, you take into account uh, the limbic system, uh, and then you go down further to the, the brainstem where uh, you have some of the fundamental pathways involved with motivation and affect, uh, it's, you know, it stands to reason that uh, they're going to be far ranging uh, neuropsychiatric and cog uh, cognitive symptoms uh, associated uh, with these lesions. And so that brings us with the, the symptoms and whatnot, that brings us to the legal relevance. So uh, pictured here uh, is a former American football player, uh, I believe he's named Aaron Hernandez, and he was convicted of murder. And in prison, he actually committed suicide. And it was found on autopsy that he suffered uh, from CTE. And so his story is one in several in which CTE is hypothesized to play a role in uh, criminal behavior associated uh, with these people, as well as uh, various other symptoms that uh, may be separated from criminal behavior. And that leads us to consider uh, just what your role would be uh, as a uh, forensic psychiatrist. And I think one of the, the most important things to realize here is that we do not have uh, valid and reliable pre-mortem uh, diagnostic methods at this time. And so if you were to try to have a current role for a forensic psychiatrist, it might involve something like a psychological autopsy, which is basically a post-mortem suicide risk assessment. So a lot of the risk factors, um, a lot of the history gathering, uh, interviewing collateral information, uh, you know, various people that, that knew uh, the person who died, a lot of that is going to be similar to a really good suicide risk assessment for someone who's living with um, the obvious exception that you just don't get to uh, talk to the patient. And, you know, currently, I think that would be maybe the, the only role a forensic psychiatrist could have at this point. If someone was charged with a crime and he tried to say, hey, I suffer from CTE, so uh, I shouldn't be found guilty, or if I am found guilty, my sentence should be reduced. There are federal uh, laws as well as state laws that govern what kind of expert witness testimony can be admissible in court. And when it comes to expert witness testimony, uh, the scientific method that is used uh, has to be 
uh, solid. It has to be established to a certain degree. And since the pre-mortem diagnostic methods are not well established, uh, it is more likely than not that any attempt to have expert witness testimony on CTE for someone who's still currently living, uh, a judge simply would not allow that uh, to uh, be present uh, in the courtroom. Now, let's say that hypothetically, you know, one day in the future, there's a good way to diagnose CTE while someone is still living. Uh, there are various studies and various uh, attempts to have uh, imaging techniques and uh, cerebral spinal fluid and blood biomarkers to diagnose CTE. So let's say that some of those work out and it's well established. Uh, I think that someone who is charged with a crime, let's take a murder, uh, for instance, uh, who could hypothetically be diagnosed while still living with CTE. I think there are two main defenses one could try. Uh, it would be a not guilty by reason of insanity defense, and it would be an, a defense of extreme emotional disturbance. The main differences between these two, the insanity defense, uh, if proved, it would make someone not guilty. And this person would then be sent to an institution for psychiatric treatment. An extreme emotional de uh, disturbance defense, uh, and some states might outline this differently, but in New York, uh, it is used to not make someone not guilty. It is actually used to reduce one sentencing. So someone would still be found uh, guilty, but rather than getting uh, life in prison, you might get a number of years uh, and, and not uh, a life sentence. And so I'm going to briefly describe uh, these uh, two kinds of defenses. Now, the, the insanity defense is actually not guaranteed by the United States Constitution. So there isn't a fundamental right uh, for a uh, defense that could include an def uh, insanity defense. However, various states uh, have their own uh, rules regarding this. Some states do not have any insanity defense uh, outlined in their laws, whereas other states do. And while you're going to have some variability as to what those laws are, they all tend to have a common thread, which is that uh, an individual, as a result of a mental disease or defect at the time of the alleged crime, uh, was unable to know what he was doing uh, or to appreciate that what he was doing was wrong. Uh, and so that you'll find commonly, the, the exact wording might be a little bit different, but most uh, states that have insanity defense uh, as part of their uh, statutes will have a, a description like that. But the, when it comes to CTE, the insanity defense uh, strategy will face a lot of challenges. So while you're gonna have various neuropsychiatric symptoms that could be associated with CTE, like anger, impulsivity, and aggression, and mood lability, it's highly unlikely that any of these would make someone not know what they're doing at the time of an alleged crime, or it'd make them not realize that uh, what they're doing was wrong. So I think that the only time you're gonna see a not guilty by reason of insanity defense be even remotely successful is if CTE progressed to uh, severe full-blown dementia, in which case, you know, a clinical diagnosis is made and it's going to be obvious that someone has dementia. And so that wouldn't be so controversial. Uh, you wouldn't even have to rely on diagnosing someone with CTE uh, it, per se. I think a more likely scenario uh, that one could hypothetically use in the future would be to use the extreme emotional disturbance defense. So as I mentioned before, it's not going to make someone not guilty, but it's going to uh, decrease sentencing if successful. So the, the idea here is to convince a jury that uh, what the defendant did was not intentional uh, to cause death. It was not the result of uh, a calm and calculating uh, decision, but really it was influenced by a very severe change in one's emotional state. And uh, an example of this would be a, a quote-unquote crime of passion. So 
someone comes home, they walk into their spouse having an affair with someone, and so uh, he commits uh, a murder. So the defense would try to explain to the jury that, hey, the average person, if they walk into a situation like that, they're going to be overwhelmed with their emotions, and they might not be fully responsible for what they do. And so it's thought that maybe a jury would be sympathetic uh, to such a situation. However, at least in New York, this defense is rarely successful. It's only pursued less than 1% of the time of all defendants. And for those who do uh, pursue this, it's successful less than 40% of the time. So it, it is very much an uphill battle. But the, the role of the forensic psychiatrist, whether it's you know, hypothetic, uh, hypothetically in the future, um, if someone has CTE and they're pursuing an insanity defense or an extreme emotional disturbance defense, some of what you do, it's going to kind of remain the same. You're going to obtain records, any past medical or psychiatric treatments. You're going to interview the defendant. You're going to interview others uh, that knew the defendant or were eyewitnesses to the alleged crime and you're going to come up with a, a differential diagnosis. But you're not just going to rely on whatever imaging study or biomarker that would diagnose CTE, uh, hypothetically. That's not going to really kind of make the uh, case decided one way or the other. You're going to have to use behavioral analysis regardless. So shortly before the crime, during the crime, and after the alleged crime, what could be found out about the defendant's state of mind? So this could be uh, obtaining the phone calls made, text messages, social media, uh, looking at video footage from security cameras, and then finding whatever eyewitness testimony uh, you can find. So if someone is pursuing an insanity defense and there's eyewitness testimony, uh, security footage showing that someone uh, murder someone and then tries to hide the body or cover their tracks. Well, it's clear that they knew what they were doing and they knew what they were doing was wrong. Otherwise, they wouldn't try to hide the evidence from the police. Uh, so in that case, you're really using that behavioral analysis, that behavioral evidence. Uh, and that really uh, helps the jury decide what's going on. Uh, having an imaging study or a biomarker wouldn't really make much difference at that point. And sort of likewise for an extreme emotional disturbance defense, uh, you're going to look at, okay, shortly before the crime and during the crime and after the crime, you know, was someone calm and collected the entire time? Did eyewitnesses say, like, yeah, he spoke in his normal tone of voice. I, I didn't see any behavioral changes with them uh, up until the moment of the crime. Uh, then in that case, you know, extreme emotional disturbance defense is probably going to have a low likelihood of success. And it's not going to matter what imaging study you could come up with or what biomarker you could come up with. It's really that, uh, you know, common sense use of logic and reasoning that the forensic psychiatrist is uh, going to uh, rely on. And so in conclusion, a lot of what we're describing is hypothetical. Uh, until there is a good pre-mortem uh, way to diagnose uh, CTE. Uh, but regardless, even if such uh, diagnostic methods are available in the future, the forensic psychiatrist can utilize them to a degree, but it's going to be logical reasoning and behavioral analysis that is going, and, and good history taking uh, that the forensic psychiatrist is going to rely on uh, the most. But even if these defenses are pursued uh, and not guilty by reason of insanity defense, very low likelihood of success. An extreme emotional disturbance defense, maybe a little bit more likely of success, but still overall, uh, not that quite uh, likely of success. So if you're going to be a forensic psychiatrist looking at these kinds of cases, you'd probably enjoy your job more if you worked for the prosecution rather than uh, the defense. So, Gakt uh, Shiku Tuevi. Wow, doctor, definitely something totally new, at least yeah. for me. It's new for all of us. Yes. Yeah. 
Very interesting. And we just got one question and it says uh, the aggregation of tau protein is what causes encephalopathy in CTE and also in Alzheimer's. What's the difference? I believe that uh, with Alzheimer's, uh, one could say that, yeah, you're going to have uh, tauopathy, you're going to have amyloid uh, protein deposits. I think with CTE, it's the uh, the involvement of the sulci and the uh, perivascular spaces. Okay. Uh, I imagine that since that's their quote-unquote uh, pathognomonic lesion that they've tried to have consensus on, I, I think that that's probably why. Just the exact regions um, specified of the brain might be what differentiates it most of all, but it is a tauopathy. So, I mean, it, it's, it's a very reasonable question because you would suspect that there might not be that much difference in clinical presentation among the two, even though interestingly enough, like I mentioned earlier, synucleopathies can be comorbid with CTE. Uh, I have one question, maybe it's not very relevant, but if we compare uh, sexual disinhibition as a crime, uh, would it be relevant to CTE? Can we justify it? Possibly. Um, so let's say that the mammillary bodies are affected and someone has like a, a Kluver-Busey syndrome-like presentation as a result of uh, these lesions then it's possible that someone would try to say, hey, you know, the, the CTE affected my behavior uh, and, and they would try a, a defense based off of that. Because it, like I mentioned earlier, you, you know, the, the lesions in the sulci, uh, that might be pathognomonic, but, you know, this could be virtually anywhere uh, in, in the cortex. Yeah. Uh, you know, except the, the primary visual cortices, and then you're going to have brainstem involvement too. Uh, so, and I, I have read that the mammillary bodies can be affected. So this could cause a wide range of symptoms. Thank you, Thank you doctor. It Thank was you. very interesting. We would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Ligafa Baladin. We are honored uh, to present her. She's one of the few new female neurosurgeons in Georgia. She works at uh, multiple hospitals, such as Eartrilli Children Hospital, Tbilisi Regional Hospital, and also in a nursery clinic. Uh, she has done her fellowship in Six Kids Hospital in Toronto, as well as one of the renowned hospitals in Turkey. Currently, she's a professor in multiple universities, including Felicity State Medical University, and we are glad to have her in our program. Well, everybody, welcome Dr. Erlika, and floor is yours, doctor. <laughs> you can share the presentation. Good evening, dear all. It's very nice to be here, and it's a great honor for me for presenting as a neurosurgeon in the neurological conference and it's very interesting because today we will be going through some very interesting parts about surgical treatments of the Alzheimer's diseases, which is one of the main reasons of the dementia patients today. So I will try to share my screen. Okay. Is it seen well? Okay, very nice. So let's start. Generally, like I will say some words about the Alzheimer's diseases. We know that this is a pro progressive neurological disorder that, that is causing to, the brain to shrink. So or if we will say in the medical words, so the brain atrophy. And in this case, when we have the brain atrophy, we have that our brain cells are unfortunately dying. And when the brain cells are dying, unfortunately, we are getting a lot of different diseases and changes in the behavioral, thinking, social skills, which is affecting the patient's uh, abilities and functional uh, independency. So one of these kind of syndromes are um, the Alzheimer's diseases. 
what day is today, as we can say. So the treatment options for the Alzheimer's disease, and we all know that we have the medical, different types of the um, therapies, such as, such as cognitive, behavioral, and some in some cases, physical as well. And uh, also there has started to do this surgical treatment for their Alzheimer's disease as well, which is uh, which on which we will be speaking like shortly. And the one thing that I would like to say that well, for about like ten years already, there are uh, different types of the surgeries what are used for that. And today I will give you some brief opinions about like pluses and minuses for all. The general thing, what we all know that we can have, uh, what is happening when we, have, when we have shrinking of the brain? It means that we are starting to uh, enlarge our ventricles. And when we have the enlargement of the ventricles, we can have the imbalance for that. Yes, and we are starting to have the specific type of disease, which is called the Hakim Adams triad. And in this case, we have the memory impairment, we have urinary frequency and balance problems, such as, as gait deviations as well. One of the uh, symptoms for this part can be seen in the patients with the Alzheimer's disease as well, because we know that in some cases they have the walking problems too. Yes? So because of this, we know that in some cases, when we have the elderly patients and they have uh, these type of things, we perform a so-called the CSF tap for them, the lumbar tap for them. And if we see that removing of the CSF for some amount, such 15 cc's or 20 cc's, are giving us an idea that the patient is getting better, they are saying that they are more active, and etc., then we see think that the CSF shunting or cerebral spinal shunt can, uh, cerebral abdominal shunt can help them and in this case give them some ability. Because of this, very often in the patients who have the brain shrinking, let's say like this, or the brain atrophy, we can have uh, very often the normal pressure hydrocephalus and for that, the main treatment, what we are uh, uh, using for that is the CSF shunting or ventricular peritoneal or ventricular atrial shunt. In uh, some cases, like uh, we don't have big study for the ADs in this particular case. Uh, there is, there were involved about 215 patients who show a brief benefit from the treatment that shows us that CSF shunting can help the patient. But of course, it's still not exactly treatment of the pathology of the AD itself. It's just a helping tool for the patient. So in the patients who have the AD and plus they have the symptoms of the neural structure hydrocephalus, we can treat them with the VT shunting. So the other type of the treatment was uh, said, like there was a thought that intraventricular infusion. So what does it mean? It means that we were taking some kind of drugs. These were generally two types of the drugs. And this one was the cholinergic agents and uh, neuroprotective factors. They were straightforward implanted into the ventricle. So it means that by, by small tap on the head the, 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 with the bar hole, by the surgical part as we are taking the biopsy, in the same technique, we were implanting the substances into the ventricles or into the brain of the patient. Of course, in some cases, like generally, if we were speaking about the botanical chloride, chloride, uh, it generally did not produce any meningeal improvement for the patients, so it was straightforward taking out. The other type of the substances that was used in this kind of patient 
was the nerve growth factor and unfortunately it didn't went well as well because we had a lot of complications for the patients. So in particular, it was the weight gain, it was in some cases weight loss, in some cases anxiety, confusion, and just uh, like imagine you have a patient with the AD which is already confused and you're doubling their confusion with the anxiety. So it doesn't mean that you are treating the patient, yeah? So because of this, it was taking out generally. As well as the, uh, the GM1 gondrocytes as well, they didn't give any specific results as well. So straightforward from 2014. Uh, these particular types of the treatment was completely taken out from uh, the surgical options for the ADs. The next type of the treatments, what we used and thought that it, would, it could improve uh, the type of the ADs were, uh, was the tissue grafting. So what does it mean, the tissue grafting? What? So first thing is that we uh, used the omentum taking out, out of the patient, such as human case of care. Uh, and we saw that in some patients who had the cerebral ischemia, they had a little bit better outcome than uh, in the, in the patients who were not treated by that type. But unfortunately, it did not give, like it gave us a small benefit in that case in that it was not completely enough and good result for the AD, but it slightly reduced down uh, the um, dementia state itself, uh, itself. But still, it's under uh, the like the the study of these patients were in a very small cases, and we cannot conclude that it will be good for the patients or not. Unfortunately, uh, the next type of uh, the yeah, disease, what uh, the, the treatments, what we used in this case were the neural tissue grafting. But unfortunately, it was not done in uh, human patients yet. It was taken in the models of uh, the rats, but for the human part, we have not done it yet because there were not very specific and significant changes for the patients as well. And of course, for nowadays, uh, more and more patients are taking and receiving the target gene therapy for the patients in the neuro, a lot of neurological disorders. And in this case, they are ex vivo given the gene, which is helping the patients and, but unfortunately, are, there is uh, uh, so reports have done only in six patients because you can under, you can think that the gene therapy is very priceful and not cheap. So to perform the study for these patients, you need a very specific outcome to see. And when you have only improvement out of six patients to patient state, that it gives you not full thinking that it's good. And of course the gene therapy can be uh, like moved aside for now because it's prices and it's outcomes in general. And the next type of the surgeries, what we were using was the electroneural stimulation. And generally in this case, we use the vagal stimulation for the patient. And to say in one year patients, um, in this case with the vagal stimulation, the patient during the one year with this type of treatment, did not declaim on all kinds of the scale what the patients were evaluated on. So we can think that it can be a little, it can a little bit improve the patient state as well. But for nowadays, the best type of treatment, which is even today going on, 
is the nuclear uh, basalis of Menias stimulation with a specific type of the DBS, like deep brain stimulation. And this kind of stimulation is giving a really good result for the patients. So here you can see it very well that this is the MRI scanning of the patient who has implanted DBS. And here is the schematically part how the um, electrode is placed in that particular area. Of course, you can think that it's a very specific and hard and the, the surgical part and etc. But it's already very useful for the patients with the Parkinson's diseases. And for nowadays, there is a very uh, generally two things what is done for the patients in ADs. This is the NBM stimulation with the DBS, and there is the warning DBS as well. In which case, yes, in which case uh, we have the improvement of the glucose metabolism for the patients, as you can see in this case. And by that part, we are getting the results for the patients. So it's completely new era for the patient's treatment. And in nowadays, even uh, the DBS is starting to be a new hope for the patients with the ADs. And uh, the Barrow Neurological Institute from 2009 is starting to uh, perform the third phase clinical trio for the patients with the AD and they straightforward, even if you will go on their main site and write down the Alzheimer disease, they will give you the criteria of what kind of patients can be involved and what kind of results they are waiting for this far. So generally, as we can go through what we have spoken so far, for the patients with the AD, the main thing and the new era can be started with the DBS surgery and maybe plus ESF shunting together, because if there, we have the atrophy with the normal, no, normal uh, pressure hydrocephalus and we will stimulate something, we can get much better outcomes for the patient. So I know that the Alzheimer's diseases generally are not the surgical one, but I hope that from my presentation, you can see uh, that in some cases, even the surgical treatment can give us some idea for this part. Do you have any questions? Yes. <laughs> yes, we have. And thank you, Dr. Lika. It was actually an amazing presentation. Uh, obviously, thank you. obviously, I think many of us didn't know that um, there is actually a lot of surgical interventions that can be done for Alzheimer's. It was a very yeah, amazing yeah. Um, presentation. So some of the questions that we got are, one of them is, at what stage would a doctor suggest a surgical treatment for Alzheimer's or other than a medication treatment? Uh, generally, we are using this part, of course, not in the terminal state when there cannot be done anything, but on the start or when there is already the diagnosis of the Alzheimer's, and there is, we can say the middle phase already not complete deterioration. In that case, this can be used because with this part and with the DBS surgery, we are very often using the cognitive therapy as well. And we are using in some cases the physical therapy too. And complexly, we can get the results for the patient as much as possible. Uh, thank you. And also one more question was, yep. okay, one of the choices that you mentioned was actually the vagal nerve stimulation. Uh, could there be any potential side effects for that? And would those overweight the, and the, and would the benefits actually overweight the side effects? Mm, uh, sorry, I didn't hear the question normally. Yeah. So the, for the vagal nerve stimulation. 
Oh, is there yeah, any, nerve cellular stimulation. Yeah. Is there mm -hmm. any potential side effects for that? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. There can be the, uh, a lot of side effects. First of all, from the surgical part as well, mm -hmm. because of the vagus nerve stimulation, it's done generally on the neck area and on the like uh, uh, upper thoracic part. It's made okay. the stimulator as well. And if we have the stimulation in that case, of course, there can be some over part of it or less stimulation and you won't get the result. So generally the patient, even with the DBS and the vagus nerve stimulation, both of them are all the time under the, the control that the impulses were normal in that case. Of course, all the symptoms, neurological symptoms, which can, which can give the vagus nerve, if there will be the stimulation more can happen for the patient. Yeah. Uh, so what is, uh, would the benefit of this treatment overweigh the side effects? Um, generally, uh, the overweight, uh, the uh, state of patient, mm -hmm. because we know that dementia, yes, AD dementia is uh, getting forward very fastly. And so if you can stop it for one year, it's a lot of time for the patient. That's the case. But as you can like see from the presentation, even the vagus nerve, nerve stimulation, it is not done very often because of the side effects. For nowadays, the best choice of the treatment, what they think, is still the DBS. Yeah. Okay, since it's pretty, also one of the new topics for us, I was wondering which procedure would you prefer? Or does each procedure has a, some type of indication in different presentation in Al for Alzheimer's? Uh, generally, I would think uh, that for nowadays, like what I have read in the different articles, uh, the Fornix DBS has the best outcome so far. I would definitely don't do any kind of interventricular uh, types of the surgeries and nerve, uh, like and the tissue graftings because uh, like the benefits of them, it's not that much as in this case. Like so far, I think that uh, the DBS can be one of the best choices for the patient. Yeah. So uh, as we have mentioned, actually, you're like one of the very few like Georgian neurosurgeons over here, which is obviously going to be very much inspiration for many of the neurosurgeons over here. Do you have any words that you want to give to any of the upcoming neurosurgeons? Um, yeah, sure. It's like one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because like uh, the general thing is that you have a lot of days when you want to quit a lot of days during the during the like students so during the studying during the residency during some case when you will have maybe one or two or several of them but the only thing is that you have to think widely like what if when you will be a doctor for how many people you will help and for how many people you will be like the main hope in that particular time when they will come to you. So for me, uh, the best thing in the medicine is helping people and saving their lives. So uh, when you are thinking that what you do and what you do next in your steps in medicine can help somebody to save a life. So I think that it's the best thing what you can do in medicine. So I'm not saying I'm not saying that it will be easy. I'm not saying that everything will just scale 
oh, so nice that you came. Don't, don't think about that. But if you will do your job uh, very well, you can uh, like achieve a, a, anything what you want. Because nobody is an obstacle for anybody besides yourself. Definitely. Thank you, yeah. so, Thank much. you so much. That's very You're inspiring. welcome. Yes. Thank you for inviting me here and thank you for this a great opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. So last but definitely not the least, we are honored to present Dr. Nana Tatishvili. She is a professor of neurology and of neuroscience department of Yeshvili Children's Hospital for over 23 years and author of more than 50 publications. She is also the president of Georgia Association of Child Neurology and Neurosurgery. We would like to thank Dr. Nana again for taking her time from her busy schedule. As of right now, she's in the middle of organizing and also conducting the annual event for the International League Against Epilepsy Partnership in Badu. So please, everybody welcome Dr. Nana Tavishu. Thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure for me to be the uh, joining the student club because you are the next generation. We hope that all of you will be even more successful physicians and researchers as my generation and after my generation. So thank you. Now I have possibility to share the screen, I think, yes. And I will, uh, today I want to speak a little about the epilepsy, what is epilepsy, what is what type of classification we have nowadays and uh, what are new terms which we use in the defining or classifying epilepsy and epileptic seizures. So general principles and classification and management. You know that it is one of the oldest diseases and you can see here the wonderful picture which on which you will see the small boy. It's in the Bible, uh, Christian Bible, that uh, this boy has a seizure and uh, uh, Jesus, uh, father asked Jesus to help him and he cured the child. And this is a, a painting which represents this part of the Bible. Epilepsy is defined as a disorder of the brain characterized by an enduring predisposition to generate epileptic seizures and by the neurobiological, cognitive, psychological, and social consequences of this condition. And also it's very important that we must differentiate between the seizure and epilepsy. Seizure is a brief temporary disturbance in the electrical activity of the brain, which can be presented with any sign. Any function of nervous system can be presented as a seizure, beginning with the anisocorea and tachy or bradycardia, finishing with a severe tonic-clonic seizure in status epilepticus or isolated seizure. But epilepsy is when we have these, uh, when we have recurrent seizures and these seizures must be unprovoked. It's mandatory for defining epilepsy because for example, if the person have the severe brain injury, traumatic brain injury, and he had seizure, it's not yet epilepsy. It's a symptomatic seizure as a function of the brain. Or if the child have the uh, febrile seizure uh, in the under school age, she, or he had uh, during the fever, high fever seizure, it also is not epilepsy, it's a fever related seizure. But we speak about epilepsy, we, when the person has two unprovoked seizures. And if these two seizures are not in the same 24 hours, because when we have the seizure in 24 hours, it means that this is a one seizure. We need to have recurrent after a day or week or months and so on. And that in this case, we can call this condition as epilepsy. Seizure is a symptom of epilepsy. Why it's so important to speak about seizures? 
because it's a we have a, a quite a high frequency of seizures and epilepsy. It's nearly one percent. Epidemiological data tell us that it's about one percent of the population. And in developed countries, maybe a little bit less, in developing a little bit more, but nearly it is 0.51% of the population. And uh, there are two uh, age groups in which most frequently we have seizures. It is a first uh, from the birth to uh, 10 years of age and another, peak is on the elderly, 65 and more. It's very common to have the seizures, but I am the pediatric neurologist. That's why I will mostly speak about seizures in children. All brain functions, including feeling, seeing, thinking, moving, everything can be presented as a seizure, but for this, we need firing of quite a big amount of neurons. If we have two, three, 10, even 100 neurons firing, we have not seizure. But if there are millions or thousands, then we can have seizures. Now, what about seizure classification? From the beginning in ancient period and mostly from the 19th century, there were many attempts of the uh, classifying uh, epilepsy. But until 2017, there were some classifications, but last one I think is the best one. Maybe the next will be even the Bad, better than this one, but nowadays at least this classification can have a clinical practical significance and the clinicians will use it and it will uh, be more easy between clinicians to speak in the same language and to have the same terms, which is uh, very important in the society professionals if they are uh, medical doctors or they are uh, scientists, it's very important to have the same terminology. Now, when we speak about epilepsy classification, first step, we must define some paroxysmal event and we must call it seizure. And we must be sure that this seizure in the nature is really epileptic seizure because there are a lot of type seizures, mostly in the children. I already mentioned febrile seizures. Also, they can be hysterical, psychogenic seizure, which is quite common one, and it's not epilepsy. If we are sure that this seizure is epileptic and nowadays with the help of the handies that everybody had handy with video it became more easy to capture the seizure at home video and then to discuss with physicians and be more sure that yes it is really epileptic one then we must define epilepsy type and nowadays there is a focal epilepsy and the generalized epilepsy that also there are epilepsies in which we have both presentations, focal as well as generalized. Then it's a good if we can call this seizure type and this uh, patient including one of the known syndromes because syndrome, and I will speak a little bit later, syndrome help us not only to classify seizure, but also to identify and define its clinical and electrophysiological patterns and also to have prognosis, treatment strategy and prognosis, long-term prognosis in many cases. So, but unfortunately only 25, 40% of cases can be defined as one of the syndromes. Then etiology, one of the most important, I will stop. And what I want to mention, you young people must begin with this because I think the 21st um, century is a century of the functioning. And we have wonderful classification, ICF. We have ICD classification of coding of diseases, 
but even most important is classification of functioning and disability. So we are not prone to have diagnosis. Best solution is to give, think about functionality and ICF classification help us to speak about function. What it means? It means that we have the body function and structure usually in a healthy child or adult. This body function and structure, you have possibility to be active and perform some activity. It can be moving, thinking, or so on. And this gives you possibility to participate to pay it in social environment. But for this, usually you need environment. Environment means not only an uh, exterior of your environment, but family support of brother or sibling or partner supporting you in everyday life, every healthy person needs it, and personal factors. It can be your mood, it can be your relationship with other world and so on. But what happens when we have some condition, for example, childhood epilepsy? Childhood epilepsy, we, if we have childhood epilepsy, if we have a lot of seizures, if we have tonic-clonic seizures, we are on anti-seizure medications. This is not anymore used, anti-epileptic drugs. Now it's called ACMs, anti-seizure medications. And this medication uh, lead us to the most of many uh, side effects, including effect of intellect, effect of cognition, of speech, of mood in early childhood on development and so on. So it restricts our activities and restricts our participation in social environment. And we need personal factors. It is a age, gender or family income because family income is very important. Drugs are quite uh, expensive ones and all of them are not within the state program. So, and the environment and so on. So for participation, we need to know what is the factors that restrict our activity and we will try to improve these factors. That's why this classification is so important. Now, what are real goals of the treatment? Maybe 50 years ago, the main goal was to eliminate seizures. But nowadays, it's not sufficient to eliminate seizures. We need that person with epilepsy will lead full and productive life. Because in uh, previous years, the people who were receiving the drugs, they did not look about, the, did not worry about uh, many side effects. And also, if you can't drive, if you, with these drugs, if you can't live normal life, then it's purposeless to treat the people. So we need to help person with epilepsy to lead full and productive life, which means eliminate seizures without producing side effects, tailor treatment to needs of individuals. For example, young ladies, in adolescents and young adults, uh, the best drug nowadays in epi for epilepsy treatment is a valproic acid, but is forbidden for the uh, childbearing age ladies. So we need to think about this before we begin treatment. It, it will stop seizures, but it will have very damaging side effect on recreational function and so on. So the most important is a tailoring to the different conditions. Now, if it's so difficult, why we are treating? Maybe it's better not to treat. First of all, uh, mostly if we have uh, young age and mostly child, preschool child, the seizures, negatively influenced development. Neurodevelopment is deteriorating with continued seizures. Then there can be uh, external traumas, accidents while driving or falling down with generalized tonic-clonic seizures and so on. 
Also, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy is two, 10 times more common in epilepsy patients than in other population. And there are also long term problems that I already some of them mentioned. It's a neuropsychiatric problems that uh, change quality of life of these people. So this last classification, there were two main position papers that come in uh, 2017. And what is the main part? I already mentioned that seizure type, which can be focal, generalized, or unknown. Unknown means that maybe at this time, of course, we don't have seen the beginning and we don't know how it begins and we can, I, can't identify it's a focal or generalized. Then we have etiologists. Etiologists nowadays are six, structural, genetic, infection, metabolic, immune, and unknown. Then we have also epilepsy types, which are focal, generalized, combined, and still unknown. And unfortunately, 20, 25% of cases have still unknown epilepsy types. We have epilepsy syndromes. And what became more important during the uh, last 20 years, it's comorbidities, because sometimes this comorbidity influence quality of life even more than seizures themselves. So we must be aware of possible comorbidities in different ages. For example, in young age, we have very one third of patients with the early onset epilepsy has also autism spectrum disorder and vice versa, vice versa, autism the spectrum in autism spectrum disorder, one third of patients have epilepsy. I try to be a quick because time is moving. What is generalized seizure nowadays, generalized seizure, as well as focal can generate in one point, some point, but rapidly progress bilaterally. And it can include cortical and subcortical structures. And this is how it works, can begin somewhere and spread bilaterally. But what about focal? Focal originate focally and limited in networks limited to one hemisphere. And when it's spread, mostly spread to the contralateral same part of the brain, but only later can spread bilaterally. We have many types of seizures, I will not stop. And all, all one thing I will mention that the same type of seizure can be focal, can be generalized and unknown. For example, myoclonic seizures or atonic seizures or epileptic spas can be focal as well as generalized, as well as unknown. Now, also in old classification, we have a term benign, which now we did not use and it replaced by self-limited because there are some forms of epilepsy that stopped at some age. For example, old name was Rolandic epilepsy. Now it's a self-limited epilepsy with centrotemporal spikes and somewhere near the adolescence, it stopped. 100% of cases are seizure free or they have during all life course one or two additional syndrome. Also, we don't use malignant and catastrophic as stigmatizing. Uh, etiology I mentioned, but there is not only one etiology. For example, tuberosclerosis have which type of etiologies? Genetic and structural because tubers are structural. So it can be more than one, the same is GLUT1, it's a metabolic and genetic both. So then we have also epilepsy syndromes and the epilepsy syndromes were defined in this 2017 classification were not change their definition, but in 2022, we have new classification of epilepsy syndromes. And it means that it's a characteristic cluster of clinical and EEG features 
supported by specific etiological findings, and it give us plan for treatment and for prognosis. Also, there are a lot of new findings in genetics, and you can see how increased the genetic mutations that were identified during the last 20 years in epilepsy patients. If before there were eight or 10, now there are nearly 100 different genetic mutations. And what is uh, important then in epilepsy syndrome, we can have one syndrome with many genes. For example, the infantile spasm, now it's called epileptic spasm syndrome, can be caused by many, many mutations, even more than we have, can see here. But also there can be one gene and many syndromes. And not only many syndromes, but syndromes of different severity. For example, this SCN1A gene have phenotypic spectrum from very severe epilepsies. This is a drave, this is myoclonic atonic epilepsy of infancy with migrating focal seizures. And also the same gene can be in a very uh, mild forms. For example, we're in self-limited epilepsy, like genetic epilepsy with febrile seizures plus, and even in febrile seizures. So it does not mean that if we identify this, that we must have very severe phenotype, but we must be aware of the possibilities. When we speak about the management, you must consider a lot of things. Gender, I already mentioned, seizure frequency, side effects, syndrome, comorbidities, everything. And last point is that even now, when we have a lot of new drugs, only 50% of seizures can be eliminated by first or second drug. And still 20, 30 percent of seizures are drug resistant. And unfortunately, it was not changed. Of course, except of medication, we have epilepsy surgery, which is increasing uh, cases in all world and mostly in childhood epilepsy because it's connected not only with a seizure control, but also with improved uh, neurodevelopment in total. We have ketogenic diet, non-pharmacological treatments, ketogenic diet, uh, different uh, stimulations, uh, vagus nerve stimulation, deep brain stimulation, transcranial magnetic stimulation, and so on. And of course, lifestyle modifications is also uh, necessary. If fails anti-seizure medications, we will try these uh, possibilities, ketogenic diet, surgery, and so on. And I will not stop. I have no time. It's already, I think, 15 minutes that I am speaking. So ketogenic diet in some cases is very effective. Uh, surgery, I already mentioned, is very important, and different devices are also very important. But what I want you to know, all young people, what is the first aid? In If you see in the street the patient who is seizing, stay calm at track time, because if it lasts more than three minutes, if there is a high risk of status epilepticus and you will call ambulance and uh, deliver this patient to the uh, hospital. But if it's uh, stopped in one minute, nothing is needed. Then protect head, remove glasses, loose and tight nequia, uh, move anything hard and sharp and tell person on the side, position mouse to the ground. And you will wait, as I already mentioned at the last slide, potentially dangerous responses to seizure are restraining, putting something in the mouth, try to hold down, give oral medication, and uh, put something on the face of the patient. So you must know what you must do and what you must not do, and then, patient will perform EEG, MRI, and have genetic testing and many other investigations and can dia diagnose. Thank you for your attention and thanks my team for helping me. 
Thank you, doctor. Uh, I would like to underline, first of all, that we are going to have a workshop about the first aid of epileptic seizure in children as well as in adults uh, in, on the Sunday. But we have a few questions. Uh, since, you've been, uh, yes. since you've been in the medicine for 23 years, I'm sure you've seen a lot of guideline changes. I wanted to focus on actually on Valproid. Uh, I, as I know, since 90s, Valproid is, has been very actively used. And you mentioned it's even commonly used right now. But from my maybe limited knowledge, I do understand there is a lot of other options. Why do we still use Valproid and not something less? Okay. Valproid? Yeah. Today from nine o'clock in the morning until uh, nearly eight, and I come directly from the, our workshop, we were speaking about the epilepsy treatment and drugs and all experts from Europe. And uh, uh, we also admitted that nowadays most effective drug in generalized epilepsy is valproic acid and its salts. But unfortunately we can't use this drug in ladies, in women. But even in women, when it's a last choice, so you can try many drugs, have no effect, begin valproate, and female became seizure free. But in case we have recommendation to use low doses, even in pregnancy, not more than 600 uh, milligrams of valproate per, per day because we have unfortunately cases when we can do nothing more than begin the valproate. But of course, it's a last option. And even in NICE guidelines from 2020, there is a statement when you have generalized epilepsy, for example, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. In men, first treatment is valproate. In ladies, you must not use as first treatment or only try levetiracetam, try lamotrigine, try topiramate, zonizamide, and if they are not effective, they you will come back to the valproic acid, but try not to. So it's, uh, I think, that uh, unbeatable drug nowadays. We hope that there will be more efficient drugs, but still waiting for them. Yes, uh, I completely understand about the other drug options for ladies. And again, speaking about the drugs, uh, we wanted to ask you about the West syndrome and the ACTH analog. How, what's the mechanism? I understand it's not completely understood, but how does it um, correlate, work? Like what changes have you uh, noticed for the 23 years of experience first of all terminology there is no more west syndrome it's a uh, epileptic infantile epileptic spasm syndrome infantile means age of presentation epileptic spasm is a seizure type and this syndrome the treatment is a quite difficult because uh, this syndrome uh, very commonly have remitting relapsing course. The first choice drugs are steroids still. If it's not syndrome caused with tuberosclerosis complex, because when we have patient with tuberosclerosis complex, first line drug for epileptic spas syndrome is a vigabatrin. If not, there are steroids. Steroids can be ACTH, and we personally more frequently use ACTH. Also, there can be oral steroids, but steroids. There is no uh, randomized double-blind uh, tr clinical trial that compare uh, bigabatrin and uh, uh, ACTH or different types of ACTH. There was some uh, trials, uh, some, uh, comparing different doses of steroids, but still first line treatment is uh, uh, steroids. But it's not, it depends 
the result of treatment depends on etiology. If we have structural etiology, for example, and most frequently we have hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy uh, due to the prenatal birth, preterm birth, or some uh, birth injury. In this case, outcome is quite poor. Also, if we have some genetic syndromes, I mentioned Drave syndrome, uh, I mentioned the uh, uh, focal migration seizure syndrome or uh, lennox gastro syndrome, which presented in the beginning with vests and then 30% of vest syndrome became lennox gastro. If we have some genetic mutation, the outcome is also bad. If it's idiopathic, which means that no etiology, or at least at this state of knowledge, we have no etiology. In this case, the outcome is better. Thank you, definitely a great full answer that we needed. There was just one question from the uh, audience. They're asking why is it not recommended in women about prey? And we understand uh -huh. the pregnancy part, but generally women. Yes, uh, because it uh, leads to the uh, quite severe hormonal changes. Cyst, poly, uh, what's the English for? Uh, polykyst, renal polykystosis. And also it's a highly teratogenic. Not only uh, abnormalities of uh, brain and spinal cord, but also it's proved that neurodevelopment of uh, children born from the mother who received the valproic acid has intellect, uh, according to Wechsler scale, uh, less scores than uh, peers. And also uh, autistic spectrum disorder is more frequent in children born from mothers that were on the valproic acid. So if it's the only, the last choice, you must try to have very low dosage. And uh, if we receive 600 milligrams per day, which for the at least 50 kilogram lady is a very small dose and sometimes not efficacious, in these cases, there is a not so high teratogenicity, but each dose is uh, higher than it's uh, highly teratogenic. That's why it's forbidden in the women to use. Thank you, Dr. Nana. This was definitely very useful for every medical student. We definitely needed this presentation. <laughs> okay, I am happy if it, it's important for you and Goodbye and see you when you want. I am ready always to talk. Thank you so much. Well, this was incredible experience and we all gained a lot of knowledge and I'm very grateful to be able to listen to professionals, such profound doctors and professors. But before we say our goodbyes, I would like to thank our brilliant administration and our outstanding program director, Dr. Egaigaladze, for allowing uh, to make this event possible and congratulations. Also we, also we would like to thank our astounding team working behind the scenes who made this event a success especially thanks to events and communication team hope to see you all next year okay bye thank Goodbye, you bye everybody bye. Hope bye. You enjoyed it bye have a nice day bye bye thank you bye. Bye.